to to your throne of grace and mercy just today. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for waking us each up last uh, up this morning after a peaceful night's rest. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to come and join in this Bible study once again on this Wednesday afternoon. Thank you for each person that has signed up so far. Pray for those that's on their way. Heavenly Father, we pray for our church family, those that are sick, those that are afflicted, experiencing death in the families. And Heavenly Father, we come thanking you for development last night in the school system of appointing the young man, Bo Hannon, from the member of our church. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Let's continue to pray for our school system. And after that, our school system will continue to work on the successful that the children go back to school. Heavenly Father, just thank you for this study. Thank you for our leader. Jesus, and the blessing of action, your son, Jesus, and we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So we are uh, here on the precipice of the beginning of Black History Month, of course, which is uh, always an opportunity and kind of a formal way uh, for us to focus in on the ways in which our own story as a people um, is spoken to by scripture and aligns with some of the biblical stories. And so I always uh, kind of direct my attention to that uh, through the course of this period that, you know, in many ways begins with the celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday earlier in the month of January. So we are in that spirit, turning our attention to a familiar uh, passage of scripture, the first chapter of the book of Exodus, and, and we'll get into um, its connection uh, to this season that we are entering. So we're in chapter one of Exodus, starting at verse one. I'm going to ask us to read this passage in sets. So the first um, set of verses I'm going to ask for is a volunteer to read verses one through seven. Exodus chapter one, verses one through seven. Of course, let us know what translation you're reading. This is um, NIV, hmm? the Israelites oppressed. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family. Reuben, Simon, a Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Jubilin, Jeb Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful and multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Very good. Thank you. Now I have uh, another volunteer to read verses 8 through 14. 8 through 14. This is a message. A new uh -huh. king. This is a message. A new king came to power in Egypt who didn't know Joseph. He spoke to his people in alarm. There are there are way too many of these Israelites for us to handle. We got to do something. Let's devise a plan to contain them. Lest if there's a war, they will join our enemies or just walk off and leave us. So they organized themselves into war games and put them to hard labor under game foreman. They built a storage city, Pitamon and Ramius, for uh, for 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 um, lost my space <laughs> for Pharaoh. But the harder the the Egyptians worked them, the more children the Israelites had children everywhere. The Egyptians got so that they couldn't stand the Israelites and treated them worse than ever, crushing them with slave labor. They made them miserable with hard labor, making bricks and mortar and backbreaking work in the fields. They piled on work, crushing them under the cruel workload. Very good, thank you. Uh, verses 15 through 22, 15 through 22. Um, this is the new revised. 
Then mm -hmm. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave this order to the Hebrew midwives. Shephara and Pua, I guess that is. Yeah, Pua, Pua is fine. Pua. Mm -hmm. When you have the Hebrew women give birth, kill all the boys as soon as they are born. Allow only the baby girls to live. But because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king and allowed the boys to live too. Then the king called the midwives. Why have you done this? He demanded. Why have you allowed the boys to live? Sir, they told him, the Hebrew women are very strong. They have their babies so quickly that we cannot get there in time. They are not slow in giving birth like Egyptian women. So God blessed the midwives and the Israelites continued to multiply, growing more and more powerful. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order in all his people. Throw all the newborn Israelite boys into the Nile River, but you may spare the baby girls. Very good, thank you. And I actually want to skip, I made one little mistake in the way I listed this earlier. I want to skip to chapter two, and we're going to look at verses 23 through 25. So we read a little bit more from chapter one that I had originally intended, but that's all right because it helps to give us context. So the second part of this that I do want us to focus on for conversation is chapter two, mm -hmm. verses 23 through 25. And if I can have a volunteer to read chapter two, verses 23 through 25. New Revised Standard Version. Um, after a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Out of the slavery, their cry for help rose up to God. God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites and God took notice of them. Very good. Thank you. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Oh, Lita, if you um, want to pull up that uh, worksheet, uh, that would be helpful. A few questions to kind of guide our, our discussion. Um, as this worksheet comes up, and, and just as a correction, again, you see up there, it says the text Exodus 1, 1 through 14, 23 through 25. That should actually be chapter 2, 23 through 25. Um, so you can kind of just make that note. It's also first question that we're looking at here today, um, just to make sure we get a grasp of exactly what's happening here in this text. Why was the new Egyptian king afraid of the Israelites? And what actions did he take towards them because of his fears? I'll direct your attention to verses 8 through 10 of chapter 1. Why was the new king afraid of the Israelites? And what did he do? as an expression of his fears. They were multiplying so quickly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He, was, he was fearful of that because, you know, if that happens, there was a possibility that they could overtake them or if they were warring with somebody, join with the opposition. And that right. didn't sit well with the Pharaoh. That's right. And which verse um, specifically uh, tells that? Uh, verse 10. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Verse 10. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. When we think about these parallels, uh, you know, you think about the history that I, I trust you all know of labor in this country. What was one of the greatest fears that Southern slave masters had relative to their slaves? It's one of the greatest fears they had, particularly as the number of slaves in their territories and states grew. Uprisings. Uprisings, that's right, that's right. 
They were deathly afraid of uprisings. It's important to remember um, that while some slave masters down in the South here just had a handful of slaves, uh, there were plantations in places like South Carolina and Virginia in particular that had as many as a thousand slaves uh, on that plantation, huge, enormous operations. And of course, these fears became kind of wildfire, uh, total flip out, so to speak, uh, in 1831 when Nat Turner staged his rebellion. But years before that, and Mark Vesey's plot had been foiled. Uh, about 10 years before that, that was, you know, purported to be a massive uh, rebellion planned up and down the uh, southeastern coast. So, and there are slave rebellions that go back as, as early as the late 1600s and early 1700s, both in the south as well as in the north, which of course had slavery um, until early uh, in the 1800s. And so one of the great fears that every uh, slave master, that every oppressor always has is if the people we are oppressing uh, get to become too numerous or just get to become too fed up with this and stay rebellion against us. So Pharaoh is worried about them growing numerous. One of the things, and, and then of course the action he takes, what does verse 11 tell us about what action he takes as an expression of his fears? Basically enslave the people, put slave masters over them and put them mm -hmm. to hard labor. Yeah, yeah. So trying to put them up under the foot of oppression. One of the things to make note of is some of what is told us in the early verses um, of this chapter. And you will see in verse six of chapter one, it says, then Joseph died and all his brothers and that whole generation, that whole generation. Um, and then later on in verse eight, it'll say, now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph, who did not know Joseph. What do you think was the significance of the fact that the new king did not know Joseph? From what we know about the story of Joseph and his brothers, why was it significant that the new king did not know Joseph? Joseph saved the uh, Israelites from famine mm -hmm, mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. um, making a plan for the uh, grain to be saved. And the new king, how soon we forget, the new king did not know the history of that. Well, that's, yeah, that's absolutely a part of it. It's a big part of it. And in particular, the reason why Joseph was able to do this um, for his brothers and for others in the land of Egypt there was because of the fact that he had found favor with the king. king. So, so the king and Joseph, the prior king and Joseph had a strong relationship. And of course, if you know the story um, of Joseph, he went through a great deal um, being taken into slavery because of the jealousy uh, of his brothers and then being you know, basically framed uh, by uh, one of the wives of, of one of the uh, upper officials of the king's court. Uh, and still, because of God's favor, finds favor through all of this and finds favor in his relationship um, with the king. And if you were to go back to the 47th chapter of, of Genesis, I'm just going to put a note here in the chat room, something that you can look at later on. Genesis uh, chapter 47 particularly verses one through 12, will kind of give you an example of that. And it talks about there uh, that Pharaoh and Joseph have a conversation because Joseph's father and brothers uh, have come from the land of Canaan and are coming um, into the land of the Pharaoh and Joseph appeals to the Pharaoh on their behalf. In verse six of chapter 47 of Genesis, uh, Pharaoh says to Joseph, the land of Egypt is before you, settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land, the best part of the land. Let them live in the land of Goshen. If you know that they are capable men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. So the relationship between the prior king and Joseph was so good that basically the king uh, gave Joseph whatever he asked for um, and gave it to him in abundance, the best part of the land, an agricultural society, of course, um, that's riches, uh, that, that is, uh, you know, turning over a mansion, so to speak. 
um, to uh, these, these folks with whom you're in relationship. And so it's very significant when we look at human history and certainly when we understand what's going on here uh, in this chapter of Exodus, that when a whole generation dies, there are consequences because relationships are lost. And as was said earlier, uh, how quickly we forget um, there is no institutional memory, right? Uh, mm. Most churches and ours is no different are unofficially run according to institutional memory. What people remember about the way things have been done. Mm. Uh, half of that stuff is usually not in writing anywhere. Um, and, and so it's always a, a, a fun adventure for pastors to uh, try to uh, scour down all the informational uh, information out there in institutional memory about the way things have been done. Um, but the reality is these relationships, right, um, can really be the difference between oppression and favor, uh, can be the difference between uh, being in a situation of plenty and joy and finding yourself uh, under the weight of the driver's lash. And so it's, I want to point that out here, the question uh, one. So Pharaoh's afraid, afraid that their numbers are going to grow too large. Um, and in an effort to subdue them, verse 11 tells us that he sets taskmasters over them and oppresses them with forced labor. So that's question number one. Question number two, and we have to look at the second half of verse 11 for this. What did the Israelites achieve while working under the weight of oppression? What did they achieve while working under the weight of oppression? What does the second half of verse 11 tell us that they did while they were working under the weight of oppression? Building projects. Mm -hmm. Building projects. Yeah. Specifically what? Fly cities. Fly cities, right? Pithom, you know, which is probably the best way to pronounce that, and Ramesses. Mm -hmm. And so um, biblical scholars and historians uh, presume that, and this is the way tradition has come down, so it should be very familiar to everyone, that the new king was Ramesses II. Mm -hmm. um, and part of the reason why they make that connection is because of this reference to Ramesses being one of uh, the supply cities uh, that was built. This is just kind of the way historians try to figure these things out when the main record we have is the biblical text. And so they're building supply cities, right? And what do we know about the history of our people in this country mm -hmm. and what our folks accomplished during the years of slavery? What were they involved in? Some very significant things relative to the history of this country. Buildings. Buildings, right? Yeah. Who helped to build the White House? That's exactly where I was going. Slaves, <laughs> Slaves did. Slaves. Who yeah. helped to build the U.S. Capitol building that was just sacked a few weeks mm -hmm. ago? Slaves did, okay? And I'm going to show you some pictures a little bit later on. I want to make it easy for a leader, so we'll stay with the worksheet for now. But I'm going to show you a couple pictures a little later on. Uh, relative to this history. So Pharaoh is trying to control these folks. He's trying to subdue them. He's trying to keep them uh, underfoot, under their power, under the power of him and, and his court. Okay. And in the midst of this, though, they are placing their own mark on the history of Egypt, because if the true story is told, as it is in this passage, it will have to be said that they had their hands in the building of these major supply cities, Pithom, Ramses. And so we see these parallels again between the stories of the Israelites and our own stories, that even under the context of oppression, right, even under uh, duress, we nonetheless put our fingerprints on some of the more important uh, projects of the history of the nation that is oppressing us, right? Uh, and so that is very significant to see. Very good.
let's um, scroll up on this worksheet to uh, scroll down, whichever, to question number three, if you will. Number three, there we go. Okay. So what was the result of the king's oppression? Did it accomplish his goals that we have talked about? And you can look in particular at verse 12 and some of the ones that followed there. Did he accomplish his goals? No. 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 Not at all. Not at all. Okay. His property just increased the numbers. They just increased in numbers. Right? And in the New Revised Standard Version, there's this great phrase in the first part of verse 12, but the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. Yes. I really love that. The more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. And that is part of the title um, of today's lesson. Um, that in spite of the sort of malicious intent of Pharaoh, in spite of the uh, attempt by Pharaoh to use this tactic of oppression and setting taskmasters over them and oppressing them with forced labor, in spite of all of that, they still multiplied and spread. And in fact, it suggests a direct relationship in the, in the New Revised Standard Version. The more they were oppressed, the more they multiply. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how about that? We're going to by oppressing ended up, right, mm -hmm. yielding the very fruit that you were trying to avoid, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I don't, you know, you, you don't want to go too far with this in this day and age, but <laughs> we have found over the years many means of resisting the oppression of our oppressors. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the means of reproduction all by itself <laughs> was a means of resistance to the oppressors. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's trying to control us, trying to keep us from multiplying. What did the Lord say? Be fruitful and multiply. We're going to keep on having children. <laughs> we, we just gonna keep <laughs> on, we're going to keep on multiplying. We're going to keep on having babies. Uh, just to continue to, to grow and to swell um, our numbers. Uh, and of course, you know, we also keep in mind that this is an agricultural society situation. And we think about a generation ago, two generations ago, um, some of you came out of these large families, people having, you know, 10 and 12 children, uh, even more than that. And some of the reason for that, of course, um, had to do with the fact that our communities were more agricultural at that time. Uh, people need help on the farm and whatnot. Uh, some of it, of course, had to do with different birth control practices and all that back in those days. But uh, this is something to keep in mind here, that literally uh, just the act of, of procreating this chosen people right, was an act of resistance mm -hmm. uh, to, to the oppression of Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to see what is going on there in verse 12, and to make note of, you know, uh, that beautiful prose, the more they were oppressed, the mm. more multiplied and spread. So that, right, the very thing, look at the end of verse 12, the very thing that Pharaoh was trying to avoid came to be made manifest. So yeah. that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. Mm. They came into being anyway. Here you are pressing them, being brutal towards them, putting them under the driver's lash, thinking that this is going to be the way that you're going to keep them under foot, keep them under control, uh, keep them from growing larger. And ha ha, look at God. Yes. They keep on multiplying anyhow, right? And spreading all over your land. And now you're really scared. Right? <laughs> uh, you started out uh, with 500 slaves on your plantation. Now you got a thousand of them. And you got real reason to worry that they all get angry and get organized. Mm -hmm. You and your little family of five or six in the big house are going to be overrun. Right? Um, and so we see these parallels uh, again. Uh, there was a great book uh, uh, that was uh, a historian wrote some years ago. I read in college called Black Majority. And it talked about uh, by the name of Wood, was the last name of the um, author who wrote it. And it talked about this dynamic 
in the early 1700s, you know, forget the 1800s, early 1700s, uh, I believe in South Carolina, um, that there was a rising black majority out there enslaved and the fear that this caused up to the slave masters and, and the book ends with the uh, Stono Rebellion of 1739. That was one of the early uh, well-documented rebellions of slaves. And so, you know, we know that that verse scripture, what, what the devil, you know, meant for good. And frankly, Joseph invokes this early on in Genesis. God, you know, what the devil meant for evil, excuse me, God meant for good. Um, and that's exactly what is happening here because the enemy is really working through Pharaoh here. Um, and he's, you know, means no good thing for these Israelites, but the Lord <laughs> and his purposes are still persevering. So let's jump down to question number four. Again, the correction here in parentheses, that should be chapter two, verses 23 through 25. But this really brings it all um, together, brings it all together. And uh, the question is, how does this passage preview the salvation of the Israelites? How does it relate to our own story as black people in the diaspora, what can it teach us? So if you jump over to chapter two, look at verses 23 through 25. What is going on there? And how does that preview the salvation of the Israelites? Well, it talked about uh, those verses turning our attention back to uh, the Israel's uh, miserable plight. And and show that God truly cares for his people and has not gotten his covenant promises made to their ancestors. Mm -hmm. And it sets the stage for God becoming active in our life and begin to establish many things at during this time. Right, right. And there's three specific things mm -hmm. I want you to take note of here. And again, I'm reading our new revised uh, standard translation. But three particular things that I want you to take note of here in terms of how the salvation of the Israelites is previewed. First of all, it says that God heard their groaning. Yes. God heard their groaning. Mm -hmm. So think about the cries of an oppressed people. We think about the Negro spirituals, as we call them, the songs that our people used to sing, particularly while working um, on that plantation that spoke of sorrow, that spoke of suffering, and spoke of grief, to know that God hears our groaning and our cries. That's number one. Uh, the second thing to notice, and that number one, of course, is right there in verse 24. Mm -hmm. The second thing to notice um, is that God took notice of them, and that's yeah. in 25, right? So God heard their groaning, God took notice of them, mm -hmm. and then Jackie, you already mentioned the third thing. The third thing is that God remembered his covenant. Yes. His covenant with them, okay? God heard their groaning, God took notice of them, God remembered his covenant with them. Just put it in the chat room there. Why is this significant? It's significant because God made a covenant uh, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that they would be fruitful and multiply, that he would make nations of them, yes. that they would be his people, uh, he would be their yes. God in that relationship, right? We talked early on yes. about how the loss of the relationship between the king and the people of Israel, because the whole generation of Joseph's family died, because the old king died, had those relationships, how that was... Um, a loss that led to mm -hmm. this oppression and to this unfavorable relationship between the king and the people of Israel. Well, here, the relationship between God and his people is the very thing that sets up their salvation. Yeah. Right? There's nothing more important for you to do than to nurture your covenant relationship with God, mm -hmm. to encourage yeah. your family to do it, and for us as a church family to encourage each other to do so because that is what ensures that God is going to keep on listening out for us, going to hear our cries, to take notice of us, and then remember um, his covenant with us. And how does all of that preview their salvation and deliverance? Well, 
if you expect somebody to come into your situation and help you, what has to happen first? You have to have a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. You have to have a relationship with them. What else? Um, Cry out to them. Cry out. That's right. Cry out. They got to hear you, right? They've got to hear you. That's right. And they've got to see you. All right. So before somebody can come and help you, <laughs> they gotta hear you, hear you. Get an issue in that mayday you mayday. Right? That, that, that SOS, sending out an SOS, that famous song, uh, I think Sting did. So, you know, they've gotta hear you, they've gotta see you. And then yes, remember their relationship with you. If you're crying out to somebody who isn't either obligated to come help you or who doesn't already know you, it's much less likely they're gonna come and, and, and deliver you. And so, um, all of these things set the stage because God hears them, God sees them, God remembers his relationship with them. And so God intervenes to deliver and save them, right? Mm -hmm. Our people were historically crying out to God through uh, these songs they would sing, uh, through the prayers uh, they would offer. What we were looking for, of course, was for God to hear us, and take notice of us, and deliver us. Mm -hmm. Here's the other thing uh, that I want to draw the connection to, and, and, and we lose this sometimes because we, we often start um, at the end of chapter two. We, we start uh, at the burning bush and the conversation between Moses and God, go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. You really got to start back at the beginning of chapter one or even back in Genesis. And the reason mm -hmm. why is you got to see where our people came from, right? Mm -hmm. Where the Israelites came from. Did the Israelites come from slavery? No. No. No, they no. didn't. They did not come from slavery. No, right? they were not slaves. From favor, right? They came mm -hmm. from favor. They came from chosenness. They came right. from vision. They came from uh, these relationships with power that uh, opened up to them plenty in the land. And it's a reminder to us, did we come from slavery? No. No, we did not. Mm -hmm. uh, we came from kings and queens and potentates, mm -hmm. as they like to say, uh, over in Africa, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, tribal leaders and a thriving civilizations and society. While Western Europe was in the Dark Ages in the 1100s and 1200s, we had great kingdoms and empires in Timbuktu and other parts uh, of Africa uh, that were feeding knowledge to the world and that were advancing in science and math and architecture. Texture, um, and, and culture and religion and all of that uh, was happening while, while the, the white part of the world uh, was in this period of, of great you know, kind of intellectual darkness. Um, and so this is really important to remember. Where does your history start? And we constantly have to kind of come back to this and talk about this. Our history doesn't start uh, in the Middle Passage. It doesn't start in the transatlantic slave trade. It doesn't start um, in, in the diaspora you know, that all of that led to, what were being spread around as slaves in the Caribbean and down in Brazil and, and other parts of Latin America and, and over in Western Europe and the, and the New World, as they called uh, this land uh, all of those years ago. No, we started out with our own thriving, in many cases, civilizations and advancements and all sorts of uh, learning and science and technology. And we're taken out of that situation, right? and put into um, this oppressive situation. Now, he, here's another thing I want to share with you, and it's, it's complicated, but um, particularly during the time of slavery and you know, Black people were learning scripture through hearing other people uh, read it through it being handed down kind of orally because of course it was illegal for them to read and many, most of them uh, were illiterate, could not read, but they were still learning these scriptures and traditions of the faith. Uh, there was an understanding that part of what was going on in terms of why black people were experiencing what they were experiencing was because of this prophecy, if you, if you will, from Genesis 15. And I wanna put that in the uh, chat room here, uh, Genesis 15, uh, 12 through 16, something that you all uh, can look at. In fact, I'd like to have everybody go back to that for a minute. Genesis chapter 15, if you flip back. 
all the way back, Genesis chapter 15. And I would like to have uh, somebody read verses 13 through 14. 13 through 14. Then the Lord said unto him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. But I will punish the nation that they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. That's right. Come out with great possessions. So you think about this. Uh, 400 years, 400 years, that reference point. Uh, in 2019, what did we mark? What anniversary, so to speak, did we mark? Remember years. the 1619 project? What was that about? Rod, I see you shaking your head. What was the 1619 project about? Uh, slavery, correct? Well, yeah, it was about the fact that there were 400 years now, 1619, 29, right? Middle Passage, uh, the first uh, black people being brought in bondage uh, to the shores of America over there in Jamestown, 400 years of oppression. And so God has this conversation with Abram, later Abraham uh, in Genesis uh, 15, and essentially prophesies. Uh, you know, that you will be aliens in a land that is not yours. You'll be slaves there. You'll suffer oppression for 400 years. But in verse 10, in verse 14, but what's going to happen? What's going to happen? He punishes those who are mm -hmm. right? going to bring judgment. And yeah. then afterwards, oh, in verse 14, what's going to happen? They will come out with great possessions. Come out with great possessions. Come out with great possessions, right? So the reality is when we think about these parallels between our history as a people and people of Israel, right? We too, of course, experienced a, a period of oppression and argue, arguably are still experiencing a period of oppression, even though it doesn't the same form of slavery as it did uh, 150 plus years ago. But we're still striving towards that promised judgment of our oppressors that will yield to us great possessions afterward, right? Mm -hmm. yes. And I, I would submit to you that every time we go through these periods of what folks call racial reckoning, like we're going through right now, it is an expression of that judgment, right? Mm -hmm. And if people of faith, particularly our white brothers and sisters, are really serious about understanding scripture, and recognizing the history and the role of this, it's time to stop and take stock of that. This is an opportunity right, to learn from this kind of expression and this moment of judgment so that we can come to the other side of all of this. Because of course, the attempt to oppress uh, the Israelites ended up in ruin for Pharaoh. And, 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 <laughs> As they sang in the old days, they were drowned in the Red Sea, right? Um, is it, where it all ended up. And so, you know, why would you want to head towards ruin uh, when you can see the lessons of Scripture? There are huge parallels between our story and that of the Israelites. And that's why uh, we talk about our story and talk about the Civil War, the Emancipation Proclamation as an exodus from slavery, similar to the Israelites. Theologians, uh, particularly black theologians, will look and tell you that essentially Jesus is Moses on steroids, Moses 2.0, right? Because Moses was the original deliverer, right? Uh, Jesus comes as the God man uh, to deliver us, and that we have always implicitly understood uh, Jesus as uh, the, the next uh, uh, phase of Moses, right? And so these parallels are, are so intricate. Um, and it is what has made this story of the Israelites so meaningful to us um, as Black Christian people uh, in a foreign land, you know, aliens in uh, a foreign land, and why the Bible has meant so much to us. And, you know, again, uh, many Black people uh, in slavery were converted uh, during what was known as the Second Great Awakening that happened around the 1840s uh, that had massive revivals by Methodist and Baptist movements. 
where many black people were converted, their masters were converted and came back and, and spread that gospel, converted them. Um, but I tell you right now, we know this from the historical record, right? Um, these folks who were in the position of the oppressor uh, didn't know what they were getting into in unleashing this Christian faith and the teachings of the Bible uh, into our community. Uh, because black people read these stories, heard these stories, said, well, that's, I see myself in that story. That's, God's going to deliver us too. <laughs> Same way he delivered the Israelites. And, and of course, we go, no, 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 I'm not talking about you. <laughs> you know, I'm supposed to be slaves. Y'all supposed to be slaves. And it created this tension. And, and the historians will tell you that that second great awakening and the revival that happened and the conversion of so many black people um, played a, 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 a significant role. Uh, one that is not probably given as much credit as it should be in some of the anti-slavery fervor. Because of course, when you look throughout scripture and, and particularly the way in which Jesus comes with the new covenant that is supposed to equalize Jews and Gentiles. And you think about uh, Galatians chapter three, uh, slave and free, right? Mm -hmm. um, that there is no more distinction between them. Well, that's a direct affront to the institution of shadow slavery in the United States. And, and so there was a real tension here and it is part of the way in which God moved through the situation, my belief, to bring us deliverance um, and salvation, deliverance and salvation. So I wanted to share all that with you and, and open the floor right now to, to some conversations and questions, of course, when we look at the um, other part of chapter one relative to the Hebrew midwives verses 15 um, through 22, uh, which I intended to skip over, but you know, it's just another example of a couple of things. One, the way that the oppressive efforts of the king were foiled, but then also how the faith and fear of God of the Hebrew women led them to find favor. Right. so that they wouldn't even cooperate with the Pharaoh and they helped to skirt those, those boys away because of God, right? So questions, comments, reactions um, to all of this. No, I was, this is Rod. I, I was thinking that like in verse eight, one of the reasons the Egyptians were afraid to grieve if, if if the Jews kept rising, they would join with their oppressors, but also they would leave. And that was their slave population, just like in the South, in America. Right, that was their labor. That's exactly right. I mean, they, they, there was an entire economy um, yes. in the South that was built on slave labor. And part of the reason uh, why uh, the, you know, what became the Confederacy was willing to fight a civil war over this was because they could not conceive of how to, you know, redo an economy without free labor, right? They had built the entire Southern economy around free labor, which was slaves. So I think you're absolutely right. There's a worry about losing a labor force. And that's why, even in spite of their fears, they kept them there and, and oppressed them and, and just try to get use out of them. And as it says in verse 12, uh, or verse 11, excuse me, they built these cities for them. They built these cities for them, absolutely. Um, only to do me a favor, pull this down and, and let's put up these pictures uh, that I sent you as well. First, the um, White House picture and then the Capitol picture. While she's doing that, others with questions or comments or reactions. Yes, I was particularly struck when uh, the midwives, again, were not Egyptian and why they didn't choose Egyptian, but that the fact that they disobeyed, you know, a direct order because had they been Egyptian, they could have carried out the plan of mm -hmm. killing every boy that was born, you mm -hmm. know, during that time. And uh, God just has a way that's mighty sweet. And the fact that they, he didn't kill the midwife, even when they told him, why did he do it? Yeah, and when you look at verse 19 of chapter one, it says the midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women for they were vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And that was the answer that they gave to the king asking yeah. him, King, why have you done this? Why have you allowed the boys to live? And it very much was an affirmation mm -hmm. that kicked the Pharaoh back on his heels a bit, right? Mm -hmm. the, the first salvos in this confrontation between a God who is sovereign and cannot mm -hmm. uh, what kind of ways you come up with and recognizing that for just a moment. The problem with Pharaoh always, of course, is that his heart was hardened and he did not let that knowledge kind of change him. And change. Him. So, but you're absolutely right. Uh, that was one of the previews in many ways in terms of this story of the exit from slavery of the favor of God. Uh, the, even though, even okay, though okay. he had the knowledge mm -hmm. um, that the midwives didn't follow through on his dictates, he didn't do anything to the women. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah, yeah that, that's exactly right. Um, and that's why I say that Pharaoh had these moments. And the real, you know, we can look at, at this Pharaoh as a tragic figure because Pharaoh was given so many opportunities to just acknowledge and accept <laughs> that there was something bigger than him going on here mm -hmm. um, in terms of the relationship between God and the Israelites that there was a sovereignty that God had that even he as this king, right. you know, yeah. didn't have. Yeah. Um, and he would recognize that for a moment, but he, he could never stay there. You know, mm -hmm. his heart was harder. So this picture right here that you all see is the second of the two. And this picture depicts the Capitol building under early construction, okay? Um, and you see down here, um, on the right side, you know, uh, a, a white man uh, with that hairstyle of the day and then pointing towards the cap and then another one here with a cane. And, and who is the one with the walking stick? Who is he talking to here? Who's depicted here in the corner? Play. 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 Right. Mm -hmm. And if you look real carefully, maybe hard to see, but there's a couple of them with their hands down in chains, right? Their hands down in yes. chains, they're in tattered clothing. And this was meant to depict um, the slaves and the, and the fact that slave labor was used um, to help build uh, the capital. And I believe, you know, these women up here in the clouds um, were meant to suggest um, that there was some sort of divine uh, uh, approval over this. And of course, we know that during this time, those who were in favor of slavery tried to find every kind of way to argue that, in fact, um, this was the way that it was intended by God was for Black people to be um, enslaved to whites. So this is a depiction of the capital and gesturing to the slave labor that was used there. Let's go to the other picture. Uh, oh, my goodness. OK, can you see it? Not yet. Okay. Hold on one minute. Okay. See it? Yes. Okay. If you're able to make it a little bit bigger, that'd be great. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you all to strain to try to read this. You know, first of all, you've got this kind of... Um, uh, handwriting from wow. these days. There you go. That's much better. That way you had it there a second ago. This handwriting mm -hmm. uh, from back in these days. Mm -hmm. And then also sometimes the use of the language is a little bit different. But what this is, is essentially a manifest from historical records mm -hmm. um, that records the names of some of the slaves whose labor was used in the building of the White House. Mm -hmm. And this is a log that lists their masters, right? And then it will list the slaves usually by first name and will talk specifically about what they were doing. They were involved in carpentry um, or they were involved in, in you know, carrying uh, one thing to another place, that sort of thing. Um, and how much you know value there was that, of course, they were not typically paid this. So this is a manifest. Uh, of course, we don't have any photographs from that time. Uh, the White House uh, was built in the latter part of the 18th century. But that demonstrates, uh, as you see up there, the left says the president's house, president's house. And it gives a date of May 1795 for the month of May 1795, the slave labor that was used. 
um, just as a confirmation of the history uh, of the role that we had in building a white house for white men to live in and rule uh, that was built by black hands. So other questions or reactions um, as we uh, come towards the close of our time. Thank you all. I was thinking about the parallel between the um, midwives in um, Egypt and our current situation where it was uh, greatly contributed to women, especially black women, the reason that our former president is our former president. <laughs> yeah, yes, <laughs> very, very well put. <laughs> well put, <laughs> well put. But absolutely, black black women voters play the well role seen of it. Midwife, midwife <laughs> to, to the next generation of leadership of this country. Yeah, absolutely right, and and we really saw the power of that uh, with Stacey Abrams and some of the other black women led groups in Georgia, uh, <laughs> turning Georgia blue, and, and then getting these two Democratic senators in. So you're absolutely right. Very good. <laughs> to that. Any other any other comments or? Uh, Questions, Wyrene, do you have your weekly question ready? Or, uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, it always amazes me that leaders never seem to realize that the way to engender loyalty is not the mistreatment of people, but how well and how how well you treat them and how much you respect mm -hmm. them. Even in our workplaces, well, when we're working. The, the, the manager that respects you mm -hmm. and supports you is the one you're loyal to. Absolutely. Not the yes. one that beats you down. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. That's but right. leaders never seem to learn that. Well, yeah, it, it, it's kind of bewildering at times because oppression never ends well. And, and that's the simplest lesson. And it's, it's really a lesson for the oppressors that oppression never ends well. Um, really without fail, um, if, if you were to get into the details, not just US history, but world history, um, there has not been a situation of oppression that has not been resisted by the oppressed, right? Sometimes the resistance is successful, other times it's not. Revolts rise up and fail. There were countless revolts before the Civil War um, that, that did not meet their desired end, but oppression never goes well. Um, and it brings brutality, not just on the victims, uh, but also the, the victors because their victory is only temporary. And this sort of what the Bible would call stiff necked, stubborn, <laughs> distance to the truth of this lesson really just points us back to the brokenness of the human condition um, and how prone we are, even though we really should know up here, it just hasn't worked out too well historically. Um, and this is a much better way to do things because of problems here in the heart, problems in the spirit, fears, anxieties, uh, preoccupations with power, uh, the way in which power corrupts the fallen human mind and, and, and flesh, uh, we find ourselves constantly um, in, in these situations, much as we did for the past four years, um, and certainly uh, other times. So I think that that's a good point, Irene. Good insight. Um, now, here's the thing to keep in mind. Because of that reality, brokenness of human condition, don't be surprised to see these situations keep repeating themselves in some form or fashion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. over the course of your own lifetime as you look around, again, not just the U.S., but around the world. It's always important to pay attention to what's going on around the world, too, not just here, uh, to see how this works out. That's good. Anyone else? Pastor. Yes, ma'am. Um, during during this time, I don't know if anybody else feels like I do, but I am totally disappointed with the wherewithal and everything that's going on. Like say yesterday, you know, uh -huh. you would have thought that others would see the light and they may see it, but are denying the light. So when you pray now, what would be something you could pray for? You know, I'm at the point now where you, and I really don't know what to pray for. <laughs> You know, so I just need some guidance on what to pray for. You know, yeah. I know we can pray and we can fast and we have to do something. 
You mm -hmm. know, we have to do something. What can we do and what must we do? Yeah, yeah. Now, what situation are you referring to from yesterday? Just so I I'm, I'm talking about the 45 senators who mm -hmm. voted against mm -hmm. uh, yes. trying, you know, trying Trump for the insurrection. You yes, know, yes. and it's, it's right there in front of our faces, you know. Right, right, right. So I really do think um, as much as some people find some of the, the biblical prophetic language harsh and, and don't really, so to speak, want to go there, I, I really do think that we are very much experiencing a situation of a judgment and a reckoning that we are exposing ourselves to um, as a people. And it is very appropriate to, to look at those 45 senators as being stiff-necked um, in the way that God has talked about um, people within scripture. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, you often heard me pray during our Trumpian season, um, at some moments for God to simply silence Trump, but always to prevail over him with the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And I think we have to keep on praying that for all of our people in leadership and government that the Holy Spirit would prevail over them, right? And when we think about the situation of Pharaoh, whose heart was constantly um, hardened, uh, the prayer is that God would soften their hearts. Um, and understanding at the same time, as you've heard me say before, we have to pray for them, but also save ourselves. So we can't allow uh, their persistent stiff neckedness and stubbornness and all that to uh, defer, you know, uh, our uh, deliverance um, any, any more, any longer. Uh, we, we have to press on and make our way. Uh, that's what the election was about a, a few months ago. Um, that's what other smaller situations are about. Uh, the, you know, this, this reckoning is really uh, causing deep, deep turmoil in the Southern Baptist Convention. And I mentioned that a little bit last week. Um, and that's going to continue as and I was talking to a friend and colleague of mine um, who, who's in the thick of some of that and, and just the difficult time they're having with this. We can't control when or if some people are finally loosed of this stuff. What we can control is focusing our prayer that God would prevail over them. Um, and that also God would save us, you know, from there. That may be the best answer I have for you, my dear. I hope it's a helpful one. Thank you. Yes. Others, questions, comments, uh, reactions? Is anybody going to run against Lindsey Graham? <laughs> well, you know, um, Jamie Harrison ran a valiant, valiant campaign against Lindsey Graham here this fall, um, uh, raised more money than any Senate candidate had ever raised for $100 million. Mm -hmm. And his efforts were really undermined by coronavirus, weren't able to do as much door knocking and canvassing and all that. People were very excited by his campaign. And it was deeply disappointing to see him get beat pretty bad by Lindsey Graham um, at the end of it all. You know, when you look at the story of how we got to the point that we got to in Georgia, uh, we're a deep South state, uh, had a lot of deep South tendencies and history that was a major slave state. Um, that had, you know, race riots just like so many other places did um, that was really underfoot of that kind of white planter class kind of mentality and all that, how that turned blue. It was because of years of organizing. It wasn't just something that happened overnight. That's years right. of organizing, years of mobilization, mm -hmm. black, new voters getting registered, all of that sort of thing, as well as an influx of black people come back to the South and all of that. And of course, Georgia and Atlanta in particular has become the center of much of that black remigration. South Carolina is a different story, um, but it is, it is a struggle that happened in Georgia has to happen over time in a place like South Carolina or even North Carolina. Uh, we have an election coming in 2022 for Senate, so. That's correct. And there, there's gonna be Richard Burr's seat up, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's going to be a hotly contested election. And it's going to be one of the races that determines uh, 
um, the, the Senate being, you know, Democrat or Republican. So people have to recognize and, and make it even more local. We, we got the whole school board up for election 2022. Um, and people have to understand that it's not just the presidential elections that are important, it's the midterm elections. Midterm. And, and all elections are local anyway. That's right. That's one thing folk aren't realizing that in order to, to effect change, it has to start at the local level without local leaders. And it right. moves up the chain. But understanding that things are changing. Yeah. Folk are losing power and things, this, this whole cycle, of this 400 years is just beginning to unravel. And those who understand what's going on are fearing for their lives, their power, their 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 stronghold. That's right. That's right. That's right. And when you get too scared and get too stoked up, we're gonna yep. find you hanging from the rafters of the Capitol <laughs> trying to take it over, right? Yeah. And yeah. that's the reality of, of what happened now three or so weeks ago. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, local elections are just as important as state and national elections. Mm -hmm. Um, because it determines so much of what happens here in, in our communities every day. Um, so people have to get mobilized. They have to stay mobilized. And all the while, of course, we have to stay prayerful while we're doing it. Mm -hmm. because we have to be persistent. And yet we have to be patient at the same time because none of this stuff happens overnight. Right? Mm -hmm. None of this stuff happens overnight. And, and none of it happens without work and without sacrifice um, and without perseverance. Uh, but I, I am hopeful. Um, you know, even while I'm sober about the work that has to be done. And we do have to turn our attention, you know, kind of politically and all that to what's going to be happening here in 2022, locally and beyond uh, our community. So that's good. Last question or comment before we wrap up. Anyone have a last thing to share? Okay. Okay. Well, I hope you all have found this to be a, a, a fruitful uh, discussion. Uh, just remember that the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. God will favor us even in the midst of our oppression. Jeff, I'm going to ask you to lead us out in word prayer here. Let us pray. Lord and precious God, we thank you for this opportunity to come and study your word. We recognize that you are in control of the whole world. And Lord God, we ask that you continue to bless and keep us to give special attention to those who are lost, those who are sick, those who are most vulnerable. Lord God, special attention to our leaders that are on the global scene nationally and locally. Lord God, continue to guide us and show us what your will is for our lives and for those tasks that need to be attended to in your priority and time. Lord God, we are willing vessels and willing hands and feet to do your will. Lord, we ask that you bless the sick, the shut-in. We ask that you give special attention to the educators, the teachers, and the children who have now returned to school. Lord, open up our hearts and our minds that we might touch someone and encourage them to take a second look at the vaccine so that we can be a healed land rather than a diseased land. Lord God, we continue to seek your guidance and we ask all of this in Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 God bless you all. Amen. We'll be uh, live on Facebook tonight at six o'clock. All right, we look okay. forward to seeing you there. Okay. okay. Right. Have a good afternoon, Bye. thanks for joining. Bye. 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 Bye-bye.